Okay. Hello, everybody. A little bit different today, as you can see. Uh, we are from the real workshop, and the problem that we're going to get today is, excuse me, apart from wind, is, <laughs> <laughs> is the fact that we're going to have customers coming in and out of the shop. You're going to hear, you're going to hear a ding dong, ding dong every now and again, which means Louise is going to have to get up and see to the customers. And the reason being is that there are only the two of us in here today. Sharon, who's normally in, has got the time off. She is uh, looking after her daughter, who's just had a baby. Uh, Jason, again, who is normally in, he's um, got some holidays. So it just means that Louise and myself can't be upstairs in the studio because there's no one to look after the shop, hence the reason why we're down here. So before we go any further, can everybody hear me and sweet Louise over there in the corner? Say hello, Louise. Hello, Louise. <laughs> so we've got only, we've only got three cameras today. We've got this camera, we've got the close-up camera, there is no overhead camera today, but the good old trusty whiteboard is sat in Jason's seat. So let me just make sure that everybody... <laughs> I'll get more life out of that, I think, to be honest, and more work. So, <laughs> so can everybody hear, first of all? Is everybody coming on, Louise? Can, yeah, everybody, can everyone yes, hear? Yes, hear you both. Yes. Hello to the customers. Fabulous. <laughs> yep. All right, so, so basically, so you understand why we're down here. Um, yeah, this place is in a little bit of a mess. Obviously, it's not as clean and tidy as the workshop that we've got upstairs. Um, we've, we've just put a camera right in front of this computer by here. All the cables here, all the cables are on the floor going to this camera. The, the, the ca cameras are all plugged in. Louise has got a camera right. That's, that's the Louise cam, that one is. So she's, <laughs> so she's right in the corner with another computer. There's another computer over there, but that didn't work with the software. So it's been a bit manic today. Um, so we're going to carry on and do our question and answer. And we're going to start pretty much, uh, pretty much on the ball now because we cannot overrun too much because our little cat, Bunny, is a little bit unwell and we have to take him to the vet. Bless him. Don't we, Louise? We do. Yes. We do absolutely. Well, so, not well. so, so no, he's not. He's not eating, and he's losing a bit of weight. So we just want to make sure that he's okay. So everybody, uh, you can you can click off that one if you want, Louise. You can click onto the left hand. So, so you can click. Different. I know. No, you can click on that one. Stream settings there. Okay. You got it. There we go. There we go. And that's always the same. Yeah. Pretty okay. much. All right, so that's about it. Um, we were going to be announcing the uh, focus group for our courses, but as we are um, such short-staffed, we haven't been able to do that yet. We've only gone through, well, Louise has been going through, but how long, is it, well, how many have you gone through now? Yeah, half a fraction. So, so, so Louise has only gone through a fraction of all your entries. I think we had over 200, was it, Louise? Over 200 entries, so yes, we've got over 200 entries to go through. We're going to whittle everybody down and we're going to come up with 10 people for our focus group for our courses that's due to come out in the autumn. Um, I think everything's okay here. I've got my switcher here. Uh, Louise is just checking to make sure everything's okay there. You can all hear me and you can all hear Louise. So, unless there's any more questions, anything you want to say, Louise? Say anything at no, all? No, I don't think so. So, yeah, it's just all rather weird down here, isn't it? It, it, it is really weird. Yeah, we keep coming in and out of shot there now. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's, lot, there's lots going on. Uh, so we're going to try and get through this with the least amount of interruptions. Like I said, I've got my little whiteboard. I may have to answer the phone, so I may put you on mute whilst I'm doing that, or Louise can take the phone into the shop, because the shop is just by there. Can I show... A little bit of the shop. If I just swing, yeah. if I just swing this round. Okay, so that's that's the back end of our shop, looking out towards the. It's not much of a tour of the shop. It's not much it? of a tour. No, it's not really <laughs> much of a tour of the shop, is it? No. So if we had one of those roving cameras, oh, we could actually do it. Can't you just poke it? I, I can't. I, I've got them. I've got long lead. Okay. So I, I just anyway. So that's it. That was the shop. That was the back end. That's our view of the shop. But the shop's out there. Any questions I need to answer quickly on what's going on, Louise, or should we just crack on with the beginning? Um, yeah, I'd like a fish out of water down here now. Hmm. Well, you've got, got your screens in front of you. I know, 
I'm just a bit of a diva, aren't I? I like to have my desk <laughs> with all my things and my sweets here. Oh, your and, sweets, yeah. You know, I just yes, feel, snacks. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind. I have to put up with it, at least for this week anyway. Um, so yeah, so we were going to have it from the, the summer house, but that didn't happen, but we're now in this workshop. So yeah, how to excuse the mess behind us. That's where Jason, oh, this way, that's where Jason normally sits by there, but I said he's not here, Sharon's not here, so we're looking after the shop and the workshop. So Louise, <coughs> shh. what day is today? It's Monday, the 24th of August. Time for our question and answer. Don't forget, next week will be the 31st of August, which here in the UK is a bank holiday. So we're not going to be live on Monday. We're going to be live on Tuesday, Tuesday, the 1st of September. But you will get your notice into September already. Are you actually giving me the day off on Monday? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I didn't say you were having the day off. I said we're not live streaming on Monday. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah see, just get, get it straight right from the start. Okay then, Louise, may we have our first question, please? Certainly. Um, Janet, Janet from Fortaventura. Um, mm, titanium strips for soldering, are they worth buying and easy to shape? Can you advise or demonstrate? <sighs> right, two things you can do. You can either go and buy, I, was pre I looked at the question, so I feel like they come a bit pre prepared prepared yeah prepared this I've got a bag of titanium strips here you can buy the titanium strips you can buy them from quite a few places now here in the UK um, da -ba -da -ba -dum. they are basically what's that four inches four inches by five mil okay what's that 80 100 mil long if I do that side you can see uh, about four or five mil long about a millimeter thick you can buy them you can buy them in strips or what you can do, and I've got on the floor down here, or you can buy a piece of titanium. You can buy titanium off eBay really, really cheap. You can buy it basically in the right, this way, the right width as I've got here. And you can cut your own. You can cut it with a normal piercing saw blade, three stroke o, something like that. And you can practice your piercing, cutting nice straight lines. This sheet here, cost me about eight, nine pounds. You can get smaller sheets for about five pounds. And if you did that, you could actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You could get about 15 of these pieces out of a five pound or five pound, six pounds piece of titanium if you want to cut them yourselves. It's entirely up to you. Far cheaper to do it this way or buy them ready-made. So let me just put you on the close-up camera for this and we shall show you. So this uh, is the titanium strip, as you can see, and I've got some clamps here that I use, as you can see. We got this little shape here, this little shape here. We got all these different shapes that I do use from time to time. They are pretty easy to bend. You have to have an idea in your head about how you want to bend them. So say we want to bend it into something like this one here. Let me see if I can just zoom in on this one so you can quickly see. That's my clamp hitting the floor. There we go. So, oh my goodness me, Louise. Oh, my legs. Have I told you my legs oh, are aching? Oh, you've mentioned it just once or twice. <laughs> so say, oh, <laughs> say I want to make this little clamp by here. If you get a pair of parallel pliers, remember it's easy to bend the long strips here because you've got greater leverage it's easier to do that rather than trying to bend this little short little piece by here so what i'd advise you to do is maximize your leverage so come along and if you want to do it accurately you can measure down i'm just going to use the jaws here for a gauge i can bend it that nice and easy with my fingers as you can see then i can put my pliers up at that end and I can easily bend it because I've got this length here that I can just bend that. If they're nice and even, what I can do then is sort of work out roughly where it's going to be even. And again, utilizing the length, bend that just like that. And I'm just literally just bending it with my thumb and likewise on here. So again, utilizing the length here and just try and bend that. See if I can get this quite even. There we go. Not quite even, but not too bad. As you can see, bend them apart. 
get uh, some narrower pliers and just bend these together. Move them with your fingers and literally there we go, there is a little clamp all ready to start soldering with. And it's nice and springy, it opens up, you can heat them up, they don't lose their springiness and they are really, really easy to bend, providing you do it that way that I just said. So clamp it and bend the longest section. It's easier than trying to bend the short sections because you get greater leverage. Um, and with that, you can make your own. As I said, buy a piece of sheet off eBay, far, far cheaper, but you do have to cut them. Don't try and cut them really with your shears because when you cut it with the shears, they're gonna bend. So that isn't gonna be very good. Always cut them with a piercing saw, you may ruin the piercing saw one blade, but it's worthwhile buying the sheets, cutting them yourself. Whew, it's warm in here, isn't it? It's absolutely boiling in here. I'm okay. You're okay, you got, you got your coffee, you're on. <laughs> uh, can we have the next question then, please, Louise? Yeah. Um, mm -mm -mm. Tess is asking, can you discuss the variety of ways to mark your pieces, the pros and cons of stamping, etching, Dremel engraving, etc.? Okay, um, stamping as in, so like you, putting your name on it, do you think? Um, to mark your pieces. To mark it, so I guess if you're looking for like, like a name, initials, something like that, do you think? Maker's mark. Maker's mark, yeah. Okay, um, I, I wouldn't use, unless you're very good, I wouldn't use a Dremel or, I can't really see it, like a flex shaft. With a with a rotary, <laughs> with a rotary burr in it, because it's not that good. It, it's not that accurate. If you're going to try and perhaps sign a name, unless you're really really experienced at writing, because don't forget, you've got this little rotary tool running, 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 running. And sometimes you've got to go sort of against the rotation, and then it goes with the rotation and so forth. So that is really difficult. It's going to be far easier for you to get a stamp made. Now I don't know where you are in the world, um, but I'm sure wherever you are, there are going to be companies out there who will make stamps for you. And um, here in the UK, we have an assay office and they make up uh, your own stamps. And I've asked for my stamps back. And with me, I've got my stamp here and you can't obviously see it, but it says AVB stamped on the end there my initials andrew berry okay um, andrew what berry andrew andrew berry <laughs> <laughs> andrew berry um or you can ask somebody to to make a punch for you do a nice simple black and white drawing send it off to a company and they can come through can produce a stamp if you're here in the uk there's a guy called john black that's j-o-n john black from i think it's black arts look him up on Facebook. Um, he's on a lot of the uh, Facebook groups. He will make stamps for you. I think this one is um, a, little, a little little Welsh dragon that we sometimes stamp on pieces ourselves. So you can do that or you can make your own stamps. And if you want to make your own stamps, I recommend a book that's just come out. And I am happy to say I have a copy here. It is called The Art of Stamping, and it's an absolute brilliant, brilliant book. It takes you through everything that you need to make your own stamps. Uh, it tells you how to, how to uh, case harden and harden your, your equipment, and it goes through, I'm not quite sure whether we can actually see it on that particular camera, but there's some absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous uh, photographs uh, telling you how to make your own punches and your own stamps if you happen to have a particular design. I recommend this book, but you have got a chance of winning this book. Not just yet, because we're going to be doing a book review upon YouTube over the next week. And from that film, there'll be a link that you can enter a competition. Simply just got to enter a competition and have the correct answer. I'm not going to tell you what anything is just yet. And then you've got a chance of winning a copy of this book. I'm going to be going through this book in quite a lot of detail within the book review. And also I've been allowed to, to reproduce some of the uh, stamps from this book for At The Bench as well. So keep a lookout on YouTube over the next week. 
for ways that you can win that book. So what was the question? I forgot, I forgot my question. Um, <laughs> Which is the pros and cons, yeah? My, stamping. No, uh, discuss the variety of ways. Oh, pros right. and cons of stamping, etching, dremeling, ribbon, etc. Okay, so etching, if you're going to etch, it's not going to be worthwhile etching it if you're just going to put your little maker's mark or a stamp on it, like handmade or anything like that. Again, if you're in the UK, you can go to Cooks and you can buy a few stamps that say handmade, or you can act, you, you pinch the sweet again, Louise? No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, the red handed. Putting them in there. <laughs> I took temptation's way out. Why am I making a noise? Sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Open your mouth, let me see. Okay, good. No sweets. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so I wouldn't etch if you're just doing a, a simple logo, your name or anything like that. Not at all. But stamping, definitely, as I said, the book Art of Stamping, brilliant book. It's only just come out over the last month or so. Totally recommend it, but you've got a chance of winning it. Keep an eye out on YouTube. I'm also going to be doing a nice book review as well for At The Bench, but you've got a chance of winning a copy of that book wherever you are in the world. I hope that was okay. Pros and cons. Next, Louise. Do we have another question, please, Louise? Yes. Um, David Collinson is asking, what's the best method to be joining waxes together when I'm assembling waxes onto the trunk slash sprue? I've been using a soldering iron on the lowest setting and it's been somewhat awful. Mm. It is. So, yeah, definitely a soldering iron is, is really awkward because even though it's here, the lowest setting is going to be too high. What you want to do is to get yourself a rheostat um, a little plug-in one that you then plug that into the mains and then you plug the uh, soldering iron into that and you can adjust the voltage or you can adjust the the, 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 the the ampage or whatever it would be and you can reduce the power of the, the soldering iron so it doesn't reach because when you put that soldering iron into the wax it basically goes up in smoke it's absolutely far far too hot but by using the rheostat you should be able to reduce that or what you can do is grab yourself something like this here. This is a, um, let me just try and get that camera to go a bit wider. This is simply a little container that you can fill up with methylated spirits. You've got the little wick on the end. And from that, then you have a bit of a flame. And from that flame, you can get a piece of rod or a, or a nail, something like that. You can warm the nail up in the flame and then push that into the trunk, into your sprue, and then put in your master into that hole. That, for me, is the best way of doing it. Either that or I will actually keep my little torch on, little Smith's tortoise just by the side of me. I'll leave that on a low, low heat, just a little bit of a yellow flame, purely the propane, no oxygen at all. I then have got a... Uh, there we go. I've got a really old scribe like this, but then I would actually poke that into the trunk, into the sprue, makes a bit of a hole. Whilst it's still molten, then I stick in the sprue that's attached to your little uh, master, your little model, and that would be a good idea as well. But these little um, spirit lamps, keep doing this way, isn't it? These little spirit lamps are really, really good. You can get replacement wicks, That'll last you a long, long time. Some methylated spirits in that. And when you're finished, just simply put the top on to stop the methylated spirits evaporating. But something like that would be absolutely ideal for you. I get everything to hand down here, haven't I? It's an absolute mess. Okay, Louise, what is the next question, please? Okay, um, Anne Kofi is asking, is there any way I could test the quality or thickness of my electro gold plating attempt? Ooh, um, not, there's nothing that I know of that will be able to measure the depth. What you're going to have to do is work it out um, by time. You should be able to uh, get from your manufacturers of you say, your plating bath or your plating solutions, um, you should be able to work out, then they will tell you how much is deposited within a certain um, set time, like a minute or 30 seconds and so forth. And from that, you should be able to work out if you leave your piece in the solution for say 30 seconds and you've got 
how much is deposited within a minute. You can half that and that is approximately then how much is actually covering your piece. But instrument wise, I don't think there's anything that you or I can actually have that would be able to measure the thickness of the plating. You just really have to refer back to the manufacturer's instructions, manufacturer's specifications and have to work back from what they suggest to the time that you leave that item within the, uh, the solution. And that's the only way that I really know how. We do have uh, plated solutions here. We have a rhodium plating and a gold plating solution. Um, and we have the specifications for that. We will leave the rhodium plating in there for a good 45 seconds or a minute to get a really, really good coating upon that. But obviously you leave it in for half that the coating is going to be half the thickness, so the wearability is not going to be as good as if you leave it in there for 45 seconds or a minute. So that's the best thing I can offer you, I'm afraid. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Okay. Um, Sandra has just bought a Fordham SR. Mm -hmm. It came with starter burrs and bits, but I'm sure I'll need more. What are your must-have burrs? Do they last or should I buy multiples of each? It depends upon what you want to do. If it was me, I wouldn't buy one burr because you could ruin one burr within one go. I would always buy burrs in multiples of six. They will come, I haven't used my whiteboard yet. Um, they come in little uh, multiples of six. Uh, was my close up, here we go. Little multiples of six like this, the Bursch burrs we use and that is what I would buy. You can buy them a bit cheaper per piece if you buy them in multiples of six. They also come in these nice little containers as well. Now it depends upon what you want to do. Um, I've got a variety of burrs by here that are literally just chucked onto this little stand here. I got that stand there. They all seem to be falling off. And I've also got some boxes as well that have burrs in as you can see. So I do some setting. So I've got some straight sided setting burrs and I will perhaps keep two or three of each size, perhaps going upwards or alongwards within the box here as well, because inevitably one will become slightly blunt and doesn't cut properly. So then you can always pick up another one quickly. You can do that or you can have all those little boxes of six in your drawer that's the battery, um, or have all those together in a drawer as well. But it really depends upon what you want to do. If you want to do stone setting, get burrs within the sizes and the range of the sizes of the stones that you're setting. If you're doing carving, you can get some, um, some uh, heatless uh, stones, grinding stones, you can get pumice wheels. Um, one thing you've got to get is, he says, quite a worn one this is now as you can see I would get these these are white nylon brushes and you must you must get them you must get them um, also the other thing to buy would be sanding drums as well really really handy to have sanding drums these are mounted already upon 2.35 millimeter shafts sanding drums you can make your own it's always nice to make your own, but I've got a nice lot of here. Um, here we go. But I buy these white nylon brushes. I buy them uh, by the dozen or by the 20. Nice white nylon brushes. Use them with Tripoli uh, to get inside ring shanks and so forth. Absolutely brilliant. You've got to get them. They are a must to get straight away. White nylon brushes, depending where you are. If you're in the UK, uh, Betts Metal Sales will sell them. If you're in the US, I think Guesswine do that as well. They sell them. Guesswine, I'm sure Guesswine will sell them. So those are the best things to get, but it depends upon what you want to do. If you do a lot of, say, a lot of carving, get some nice uh, ball burrs, something like that. Uh, but polishing, white nylon brushes, are an absolute must with your Tripoli. And we use a bit of pre-polish. This is some Menzerna down here as well. So those are the main sort of things that you've got to think about, but it depends upon what you want to do. Uh, maybe have the next question, please, Louise. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Johan is um, wanting to make a product out of 999 silver, but in some parts it's only 1.2 by 1.6 mil thick. Is that too thin for fine silver that has been work hardened? Thanks for making me look forward to Mondays. Oh, cool. That's very nice. Thank you so much indeed for that. It depends, again, it depends upon what piece it is you're making and if that little section it should be fine it should be no worries at all depends on whether that piece is 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 structural whether there's a lot of stress or whether there's a lot of force upon that piece i think is it 1.6 by 1.2 mm, yep. yes yeah i think that should be fine um if it if it's pure silver it's going to be quite soft as long as you work hard on it it should be okay as i said structurally if it's for a bar for a bar brooch and you've got a fitting upon the back well that bar has to be quite rigid and i would not say that would be strong enough but if it is there purely for decoration for aesthetics i think that should be fine but if it's stress related and structural there's a load on it do you know what i mean about that if it's if it plays a part in in compression or bending on its own it would need to have uh, a little bit of a thicker section or have some other support around it to be able to give it that bit of strength uh, next question please Louise. okay um robin has been asked to size a ring up one size it's an old ring that has about 20 stones that were glued in I removed all the stones because they were falling out. Can I do this on mandrel slash hammering? Uh, no, I wouldn't. One size. The problem is if you start to hammer, you're going to start to close in the holes. That would be the problem, unless there is an area where there are no holes. So, um, Louise has to go. <laughs> Mind the leads, Louise. Try not to trip up. We've got a one. You're going to have to turn me off now. Okay, yeah, okay, so I've got to turn Louise off. Okay, you're off. So basically, yeah, we got a one in, one out system, so we have to let people in. So, yeah, so say you've got your circle, your circle here, and you've got holes come through where the stones are set, like this. Bear with. Thank you. So as long as there is space, you may be able to hammer within that area. But I would never consider hammering anywhere near the stones because you hammer, you're going to find that the holes are going to close in and that is not going to be good. Thank you. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk past, Louise. No, no attempt to limbo underneath, is it, Louis? I'll do that next time, shall <laughs> I? It's limbo. So that's what I would do. If there is an area that you think you can hammer, to stretch it one size, find that area. If it's basically, that's like a cross section through the ring. But if there's nowhere, you are not gonna be able to hammer. Cause as soon as you start to hammer here, this is gonna be dented here and you're gonna be pushing the holes closed and it's not gonna be good. If that is the case, I would simply then cut through it, open it up, put one piece in the UK, that's 1.75, millimeter for one size put a piece in and solder it back i would put something um some pencil lead some snow peg tipex something like that in the holes to stop the solder from flowing into the holes to keep the solder in that particular area but i would put a piece in as you don't have the stones in that the stones are out cut it piece in solder it finish it glue the stones back in and that would be the best bet if you ask me um your microphone's on Next oh, question, please, Louise. Okay. Um, Josh is asking, what are the best techniques for breaking out stones from old settings, especially bezel set and flush gypsy set stones? Breaking them out, as in smashing them, or, yep, yeah, smashing them. Um, I would perhaps, if, if, if you want to smash them out, if you've got no regards to the condition of them and you just want to get rid of them, get something like a steel mandrel, Put the ring upon the steel mandrel, then get a, a hammer and a small little nail or a steel punch and literally just, just smash them out. Uh, you know, you've got your ring here, your stone is set in this little area here, like that there. Just get your punch here, this is your punch, 
and just hammer it and smash it out. That would be the best way. It was smashed out, wasn't it? Break out. Break out. Break it out, if that's the case. And likewise, within a bezel, if you have um, a ring within, sorry, a stone within a bezel like that, I would get the punch right in the center to smash and crack the ring. And the reason why I say put it onto a metal mandrel is because it's obviously metal. And when you tap it, the ring isn't gonna give it's going to enable the stone to be smashed out far, far easier. If you are wanting to melt it down, melt the metal down, I would literally just get a hammer and smash the whole ring to smithereens or use an old pair of uh, top cutters, something like those there, to crush it and to crush the stones out. Because we find bits of stones all over the floor where we've actually smashed the, the thing out. If you want to try and get the stones out in one piece, really, really hard to do, what I would then advise you to do is to get a scalpel, something like this uh, upon a nice metal handle or plastic handle, and you have to use the very, very tip, nice and sharp, to get between the stone and the bezel and just work it around and ease the bezel away from the the stone itself don't put any pressure upon the stone chance the stone is going to crack but be very careful you perhaps use an old scalpel but the point has to be really nice and sharp just to get in there just to, to ease the stone out if it's flush set you've got a heck of a job to try and do that and perhaps if that was the case i would um, perhaps get a very small graver and grave, engrave, remove the metal with a graver around the edge and then try and push the stone out from the back if you possibly could. But that would be the best way. Then you've got a bit of a problem in trying to reset the stone. So you may have to put a slightly larger stone or set the stone a little bit lower so you can get more metal coming over the top to hold it into place. Um, yeah, I think that's about, about the best that I can suggest. Do we have the next question, please, Lovia? Yes. Um, Stephen is asking, <clears throat> what's the best way to clean a silver ring or pendant with a bezel setting without taking out the stone? Vinegar, salt, pickle, any suggestions? Um, so, you have, well, okay, so the best way you can do that is if you get some silver, I don't know, people, people don't like silver cleaner or silver dip because people say it attacks the silver. But if you can get a little bit of silver dip on a bit of cotton wool, or a bit of a cotton wool bud, cotton bud, something like that, dip the cotton wool bud in the silver dip, and then just rub it over the silver itself, wash it off straight away, and you should be able to get the tarnish off, if that's what you're talking about, is to, to clean it that way. Um, some people will use sort of bicarb with some silver foil in a piece of, um, in some water. I've never ever tried that, but people say it does work, but the problem is that causes an electrical reaction that actually eats into the silver, so that is not something that I would, I would do. Or if you've got some rouge, some powdered rouge, or you can actually buy some, I'm quite sure I've got some behind the, let me have a look, you may have something down here, let's have a look. Or you can buy what's called like a silver foam, uh, like this here, there's the camera, there we go, some silver foam, and this is, like a block of almost like a block of rouge inside this way here we go you can see that there that's almost like some rouge and with that again a little bit of gentle cotton wool cotton bud rub it onto the rouge or if you've got some powdered rouge something like this here this is some rouge that we use uh, get a little bit of that and rub that upon to the silver. Obviously, staying away from the stone. A little bit of silver dip or a little bit of rouge like this, if it touches the stone briefly, you should be fine. But this is what I said about washing it off virtually straight away and keep applying it to get back to the silver colour. And once you've got all the tarnish off, then you can perhaps then come along with a, a nice soft cloth, a nice uh, selvit cloth something like that, or like this here, then to go over the silver, just to bring up the shine, basically without putting any mechanical means or mops or anything on it, and that would protect the stone really, really well. 
Louise, may we have the next question, please? Sorry, you're busy there. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Lorraine is trying to find out the best match in solder and copper joints of stacking rings. Um, I've tried Rio's copper solder paste, but it's soldered black and the silver shows. Okay, so um, you can get, I think, almost like a copper paint. So you can use silver solder and then go over the solder once you've soldered it with some copper paint. But there, I don't think there is any successful way of soldering copper without anything showing. Um, I know I know Rio did, but you said you just, just tried Rio, didn't you? Try and perhaps another manufacturer of like a copper solder. But I know there's a, there's a solution that you can paint onto the silver itself that will actually perhaps coat it in a copper color that excuse me, that may match the rest of the the piece you're working on but apart from that i don't know of any other way and also don't forget if you are silver soldering copper you should only have the most smallest minimal amount of solder showing because you're going to be cleaning everything up but as far as i'm aware of there's no way you can totally get rid of your silver solder joint i'm afraid sorry about that Yes, Louise. Josh wants to preserve the stones, not without damaging them. <laughs> not to smash them out. No. Okay. So to be we... fair, you said smash them out. What did What did Josh say? Bash them out. Sorry. But he didn't uh, mean that anyway. So, <laughs> so, so like breaking them out. Breaking them. Yeah, sorry, breaking them. Different to smashing them out. <laughs> well, um, break, breaking them, <laughs> smashing them. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I would use the scalpel to try and get in between the bezel and the stone itself, like I was suggesting. But as I said, if you are, um, if you do have a flush set, well then get a very, very small, very small. Let me explain how close we can go on it. A nice little engraver like this here something like that there just to get around the edge of a flush set stone just to remove the metal that is holding that stone into place remove as much as you possibly can if it's a diamond you may be able to push it out then from the back um, but that's going to be the only way that you can really get it out but the scalpel technique really does work because you can get the scalpel point in between and just ease up the metal so you don't want to let's say try and lever you want to just try and lift it up this way. So don't push the, the scalpel in. Don't do that and leave it because then you put a lot of pressure onto the stone. But when you get the scalpel in, just try and ease it up and lead up the lip of the bezel all the way around. So if it's a really thick bezel, you've had it. So you have to tell the customer it's at their risk. If you, oh, in, in fact, what you could use is if the bezel is a little bit higher than the stone itself, you can always use uh, this, is a, this is a big one, this is a small one. You can also use one of these. These are like prong lifters. That's a large one, this is a small one. And you may be able to get this on the edge of the bezel and lift and pull the bezel backwards. But if it's a flush set, you're gonna have a heck of a heck of a job to do that. But these are really good. Um, yeah, prong lifters, claw lifters. You can get them in various sizes and they'd be ideal for lifting up a bezel providing the um, so there's your stone here providing you've got a little bit of bezel just above the stone itself you could then get your, your claw lifter in there and just to ease that back a bit and that'll be your best way sorry for the confusion next question please Louise uh. Okay, Kevin is asking, where can I get a bezel to lock a ruby in 20 mil left side, five mil, then 20 mil right, so it will lock the stone in place, then add a jump ring? Say that again, sorry Louise. Where can I get bezel to lock a ruby in 20 mm. mil left side, five mil, then 20 mil right? I don't understand those dimensions. Where can I get a bezel to lock a ruby in 20 mil left side, 5 mil, then 20 mil right. So it will lock the stone in place. Do I understand? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I don't know. Can we have a bit more yeah, detail? Could, on yeah, can we have a bit, bit more information on that? Give me a bit more information and we should be able to answer it, but I'm not really sure what, what you mean, the dimensions. Sorry. 
But yeah, just give me a bit more information, I'll happily answer that. Yekin and Louise, may we have next question, please? Next, yeah, yeah, yes, yep, 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 yep. Jessica, is there any way to remove dings or dents from sheet metal? I sawed a pendant from sheet metal, but there is a corner that was bent from previously using shears um, that I'm having trouble hammering out. Not really. There's no way that you're going to get a dent out of a flat sheet unless you remove the metal from around it to bring it down to the lowest section. Um, if you've got a laser welder or a puck welder, you could add metal to that dent to bring it higher. You can sand it flat. So if your piece of metal is like this and you actually happen to have a little area like that that's dented like this, there's no real way you can't really solder it because if you solder it, the solder is going to show. You can't fill it with solder because the solder is going to be a different alloy to the rest of the metal and it's going to show. So the only way you can do that, some people would say you can burnish it out. You can do if you get a burnisher and you may be able to burnish the metal on either side that way. So you basically take the metal down lower to meet it uh, or you just simply remove the surrounding metal down to that level and you just basically remove a thin, thin layer. You can burnish it. Lots of people burnish it. If they slip, they will burnish the metal back, but it'll always have a slight dent or the metal will be slightly lower. There's no way you can do that. If you've got a laser welder or a puck welder, you should be able to add the metal into the ding, as I just said, or the dent and then you'd be able to finish the surface. That would bring it up to the correct level. But there's no real way of doing that, I'm afraid, as far as I'm aware of. You can use solder, but solder is going to show. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Mm. OK. What is the best way to fabricate a silver curb economy chain link? Um, I want to keep that girly style, and that's Andreas. Um, a economy. Okay. Um, the best way to do. Fabricate a silver curb economy chain link. Okay, so basically they're just like a curb chain then. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be. Um, easiest way to do that is to make oval links. You can bend wire around an oval nail. I love nails. I keep uh, quite a few in my drawer because we have an ironmonger's next door. Get an oval nail to put the wire around. If you don't happen to have an oval nail, put two round ones side by side and perhaps solder them, close them. Look, look at me in my raffle. <laughs> That's really later. Um, and then you can wrap the wire around. You're going to get oval links. You can cut the links, put the links together as if it was like a, a uh, in this country it's called a trace. What's it called in the US? Cable, not cable, cable, something like that. And then once you've got all the links soldered together, you fasten one end into your vise. You get the other end, you pull it, you, you, not, you just take up the tension and then you twist it. And as you twist it, all the links are going to twist into shape. You twist it past its, its sort of uh, horizontal length, so to speak, because as you twist it, you can see the spiral developing. Keep twisting, keep twisting, keep twisting until there's no spiral in the length of chain. Once you've done that, take it a little bit further than where you have to. Then if you've got a rolling mill, you can pass it through the rolling mill to ensure that every single twisted link is exactly the same. You may find that when you hang it, it'll slowly sort of untwist or twist. Uh, but there's no real way you can do that unless you hammer each individual link the same length, sorry, sorry, the same depth, or you put it through, and I'm pointing behind there because the roller mill is just behind there, um, or you put the roller mill to get a nice even twist on every single link. And that would be the best way to do that. Why are you smiling? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think I've, we, we've made that, if you've gone on YouTube, there's lots of people making um, uh, curb chains on YouTube. If you're on Instagram, search for a company called CMG Links. They do nothing but curb links and they got some fantastic, fantastic videos and pictures of curb chains that they make. They make them in 9 carat, 18 carat, they make it in pure gold as well. 
absolutely fantastic so time consuming but the chains are absolutely gorgeous instagram it's c m g links but yeah sit on youtube and on at the bench as well we've done some films on curbs as well so next question then please louise okay um mm, mm, mm. Cheap metal, sorry, um, how far did we get? Um, Joan is, oh, that was about the storm, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well organised, I've, I've, I've been chatting. Yeah. I've, I was just, suddenly so, you've got a drawer full of nails. As in masonry nails? Oh, masonry nails, okay. No, not fingernails. No, 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 I know. I'm not no. No, no. no, no sorry, sorry, it's not a, a drawer full. There, there's quite a... Am I, am, I, am I missing something here? You've just bought them today, have you? Well, which ones? You're missing new nails. <laughs> oh, hell. I haven't. <laughs> ah, no, yeah, I, oh, hell. <laughs> uh, I have a... We bought a picture on the weekend and i got to put it up. I don't have masonry nails, no. Next question, please, please. Can I ask next door <laughs> what they are? I'll get masonry nails from next door. We can put the picture up, don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, how <laughs> can I prevent my brass turning pink when pickling? I use the same pot for both silver and brass, and I use Spirex, Sparex? Sparex, yep. Sparex. Okay, so basically, don't use the same pickle. Don't use the same pickle for, uh, for your silver and your brass, because the silver alloy has copper in it, and that is what is happening. Now, as you then put the brass into the pickle, there is going to be, a de in suspension, there's going to be some copper and that then is going to be deposited up onto your brass. Try and have two separate containers, one for your silver and one for your brass and then the brass should stay nice and clean because there will be no copper in the solution that will be transferred into the brass. So there's no real way that you can do it. You may be able to, to sort of to get a brass brush to scratch brush it off, but if you're using the same pickle, you're always going to get it, so separate your pickle. One pickle for silver, one pickle for brass. Next question, please, Louis. That was quick, wasn't it? Good. Um, uh, right, David is asking, I need to make a vulcanising frame so I can cook rubber in my toaster over. Toaster oven. Wood casting Legos from aluminium be a good solution for making a customisable sized frame or box? Say that again. Sorry. I need I, to make a make an adjustable frame. frame. Yes, okay, yeah. So I can cook rubber in yes. my toaster. Yes. Oven. Yes. Wood casting yeah. Legos casting from Legos. aluminium. Casting Legos. Legos. Or, or is gentleman going to cast Lego in aluminium to make an adjustable frame? Be a good yeah, that's a good idea. For actually. making a customizable sized frame slash box. Mm, that's actually quite, quite a good idea. I think, is, is that what you mean? You want to cast. Lego to be able then to assemble a frame. I think that's a very good idea. Um, the other way would be to simply make. Um, if, you, if you're going to go to the trouble of casting Lego, why not cast the frames? That would be my argument. And in fact, frames are really quite cheap. So perhaps we wouldn't even. Well, Lego's fun. But le Lego is fun. <laughs> because your frames have got slightly rounded edges like that, haven't they? They're slightly rounded, and don't forget, there's always a hole here to allow for the sprue, or the metal, because you've got your master, and you've got the bit of a piece of metal, there has to be a hole for that to go through. And I've you can, you've got various depth frames, so yes you can, make cast Lego and aluminium if you want to do that. Me personally, these frames are really cheap. Um, I've got a double frame that, and I've also got um, two other frames, like a, about a 12mm and an 18mm, but they're really cheap and I, I, I would, I'm just too lazy if that's the case, I would go and buy them. But if you want to cast Lego to make an adjustable frame, yeah, why not? Really good idea. I like it. I like it. Show us it. Show us your cast Lego adjustable vulcanizing frame. It would be really interesting to see that. Really interesting. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Okay, Roy um, is saying if I have an option to use a propane slash oxygen or 
Tessalin. Yes, that one. A slash oxygen gas for a smith torch. Does one work better than the other? I have tanks and regulator for both. Um, I, um, I would. I personally always use propane. I find that propane for me is a cleaner gas. Some people who use acetylene, um, sometimes if you get the mixture not quite right, you'll find there's a lot of carbon uh, being produced and little tadpoles that come off the flame and they fly around. I find acetylene is a dirtier flame. I find acetylene, you will have a lot more dust and smoke and carbon all around the place because for me, I think it's a much dirtier flame. Um, it perhaps it burns at a higher temperature, but I've had no problem with propane and oxygen. As I said, I've got a Smith little torch by here. I've had this for about 10 or 12 years now, perhaps even a bit more than that. Close to about at least about yeah, 12, 15 years. Um, and I've used propane, I've got propane tanks, and with oxygen, I've got no problems at all. You can use that for for welding platinum as well, and I've got no problems. For, so for me, I would always go for propane and oxygen. It's a cleaner setup, it's a cleaner gas, but if you've got tanks of acetylene, you may need separate torches if you use acetylene and propane, so just double check. I'm not quite sure whether you can get specific hoses for acetylene as opposed to propane. Just double check the tool suppliers for that. But for me, I'd always use propane and oxygen. Next question, please, Louise. Okay. How are you liking uh, it today over there? Are you getting used to this now? No. 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 Okay, no. We'll be back upstairs. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, okay, Jane is asking, a couple of weeks ago you mentioned a tool that holds a stamp so you can punch in the centre of a blank. Yes. I can't find it anywhere and I really need it. Yes. Did you I'll... mention someone called Jim Lloyd who has one? He does, yes. Okay, can you make a note for me to contact Jim Lloyd? please, pen and paper. Jim Lloyd, um, he bought it from America, so I'm going to have to find out, and perhaps next week we can mention it on the question and answer on Tuesday, won't we? Oh yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday, the question and answer. Yes, um, I'm going to have to find out, I don't know the name, um, yeah, so we're going to have to contact Jim Lloyd, um, and I'll certainly ask Jim where he got it from, or at least the name, because I know that's what he does. So, yep, yeah, I will certainly find out for you, no worries. Uh, next question, please, Louise. Uh, Jim Lloyd, yes. Um, uh, Ethiopian, yeah, we talked about the opal. Bill has got an opal, which um, my friend wears all the time, and what will cause it to go cloudy all of a sudden and lose its luster. But I think George helped with this as well and it's probably its porosity. It's dried out. Do you think it's dried out or do you think it's absorbed? Um, depends. But if it's worn all the time? Because hmm. the... Mm, they are porous mm. and they usually have to be kept, not kept wet, but they like moisture, don't they? So, but they don't wear, yeah, but... They can dry out. Well, they, it's an Ethiopian pearl. Are they more porous than... Opals? Opals. Uh, uh, opal, yeah, yeah, sorry, opal, opal, opal. I don't know well, what the difference between Ethiopian and, and Australian, I don't know, but mm. they, they, because it's the water within the opal that also helps with the fire and the way it, sh it, it reflects the light. And I think if that dries out, then you're not going to get that sort of cloudiness. So, so then you'll get the cloudiness if it dries out because there's nothing in the opal that will cause the refraction of light. That's Do you what think I'm, it's dry? I, I may think it's dry, yes. Mm. And I don't think you can get that back. I don't think you could get that back. So that would be what I think would be the case. Mm. Unless it's been put in some sort of weird solution. I don't know. Mm. That would cause the opal... Very liquid. You don't know what, don't know what it's... No, exactly. Chlorine? Could be. Mm. So it's either it could be one they or the other. They don't really need to be worn every day, though, were they? They're not that sort of stone no. that's durable and. No, no. But they need mm. to be kept moist. If you let them dry out, they. But not they wet. Lose. You don't immerse it, though, do you? No, no, not at all. <gasps> <gasps> Louise, you're calling into action. I've got a customer. Don't worry about limbo. Uh, okay. I'll turn you. I'll turn off your your microphone. Okay. Um. Next. Oh, I can't see the next question. Can I? I'm not here. Let me just go and check on the questions a minute. Uh, okay, um, real stats, uh, what's the highest uh, on the market? I hear so, and talking about higher than 925, does it exist? Okay, 
so can you see me am i on that one yes i'm i'm on this one here okay um what's the highest content of silver in the soldiers available on the market i heard someone talking about higher than 925 i really don't know but let me just check oh okay so i've got my cookson catalog in front of me i will go to uh, silver solder um, I can only find sterling um, there may be some specialists that would do fine silver um, dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. platinum I think you can you can get enamel in which is the solder that you need if you are obviously enamel in silver that sort of thing um, which then does melt at a very very high temperature they do fine to britannia sheet britannia so that's 950 isn't it britannia sheet uh, sheet 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 britannia i can't see i can't find silver no I can't see, especially in the Cookson catalogue here, Cookson Gold, I can't see a solder, sorry Louise, that is higher than 925. There is a melting point, a melting point definitely, but I can't see a solder that is higher. Alternatively, you could always make your own solder um, by using fine silver and using other alloys then to reduce the quality. Are you over there now? Are you? <laughs> that would be the only other way that we can do it. Let's swap seats, please. Let's swap seats. Yes. <laughs> okay. Next question, please, Louise. Okay. Um. Uh, oh. Which one did you answer? The solder one. The highest content of silver and solder is available. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, is that what you answered? I did, yes. Okay, Jeanette is asking, how do you drill a hole in a tumble stone? I have watched videos on YouTube where they use a Dremel diamond drill, yep. but it takes ages to drill the hole. I've tried with water and without. Mm. Perhaps the, the diamond bit is not sharp enough, and I think it's important not to overheat it. So the best thing to do, as I said, as you just exactly said, is try and drill it under water to so make a little, a little fence Put some plasticine around it so you can hold on to the stone. Hold on to the stone has to be submerged under the water and just get your bit. Obviously being very careful because you've got water and electrics to so take extra care. If you've got a little vertical press that you can use to bring it down, it will take time. It's not like drilling through metal. You can't go fast. The idea of the water there is so the bit does not overheat and it gets rid of all the, the dust as well. Try it with a brand new diamond bit, and I know you can get specific diamond drill bits for drilling through stones. So try one of them. That would be the best thing that I can suggest. But it does take a long time. As I say, it's not like drilling through metal. You could be there for, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, just simply just drilling a hole. It does take time. But don't overheat it. Submerse it underwater. Try a brand new diamond bit. Next question there, please, Louise. We're coming towards the end and we, got, we are going to have to finish pretty much on the hour today. We've got to take our little cat to the vet. So next question, please, Louise. Okay, negotiator. Mark, Tom, Mike. Oh, no, no, no. Tom. Yeah, Tom. Um, can I take white gold prongs and soldered, soldered on yellow gold? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. You can uh, get. You can get something called ready prongs in the U.S. that you can buy, and they are little sort of little hemispherical tips that you can solder onto claws. They have the solder already attached onto them. They're absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love them. I bought a whole set from. I think it was Stulla in the U.S. You can go to Stulla, but you may be able to buy them cheaper and quicker from ready prong themselves but yes you can use white gold on yellow claws not a problem and in fact it would look quite nice actually next question please Louise um, sorry <laughs> I've lost my place again how far did we get 
uh, prongs. Okay, yeah. Teresa, um, I'm growing my own, growing in my technique through practice, but struggle with coming up with original designs. Ideas for gaining inspiration that can be converted into jewelry design. Uh, nature, nature's always a good one. Um, trip to the museum, that is always a good one. Another th things that I quite like looking at, um, there are books out there, some like thing like thousand rings, thousand pounds, there was a hundred rings, hundred pendants, something like that. Just looking through, seeing what sort of inspiration. Obviously, you may not be up to those that standard of, of craftsmanship just yet. You still may be trying to put things together. Scour the net, go on places like Etsy, go on just Google and put in rings, pendants, something simple. Look at ideas, look to see how things are put together. Perhaps go out and you see architecture, perhaps you look up at the skyline, you see some branches, you see um, the rooftops and you see the ideas and how can you relate that into your designs. Um, mountain tops, you can just try and pierce a mountain top range, solder that from copper onto a back plate of silver or vice versa, turn it around into a ring. There's lots of different things that you can do practice with. You can, there's, it's, it's just trying to get your head around seeing things, looking around. There's a grill on the window there. How can I reproduce a grill in gold, in silver? How can I do it? Can I weave it? Can I cut it? Can I lay them on top? Can I solder them? Can I pierce out the shape? You know, you've got Louise's lovely blouse there. It's got some gorgeous, gorgeous roses on it, as you can see. So how can I just translate those roses? Can I pierce the shape and then pierce the petals, pierce the shape. Can I layer something on top of the other? It's all about trying to see something and then wondering, well, how can I make it? What can I do that will give the impression of layers or shapes or lines or angles or three-dimensional effects? Perhaps something that is nice, highly polished at the back, have something matte in the front or vice versa, different shades, different colors of metals. There's lots of different ways, but I think you have to get into your head, how can I do it? You just don't see a mountain range and go, oh, there we go, I can make that. But you need to think about how you're gonna translate what you see into metal or into wood or into plastics or into leather, try and incorporate the two. You, how about, I've got a project planned for at the bench where I'm using a disc cutter to cut metal, but I'm also using a disc cutter to cut leather as well and to produce different layers. So you don't have to have just purely metal, other materials as well, acrylic, perspex, plastic, um, enamel, uh, cold enamel, resin, there's lots of different things that you can put together to make shapes, to make designs and so forth. But you have to get it into your head. How am I going to make it? As I said, Louise has a nice, gorgeous little brooch there, brooch, a brooch, blouse there. The flowers, you know, you've got, you've got the dark sections on the flowers, you've got the dark sections on the roses, Ooh, wrong one. Um, how can you translate that into a piece of jewellery? So that would be the best way to do it. I think I've got time for one more question. I just heard the door on the shop unlock, which means it's five o'clock. Got one more minute, I think, Louise, for one more question. Yes. Um... <laughs> yeah. I thought you'd finish. <laughs> um... Yep, yep, yep. Go on, pick anyone. How do you make a nice decorative gallery wire like crown or zigzag or scalloped? And that's Jeanette. Okay, um, a nice easy way of doing that would be uh, to get a strip of metal like that, get a pair of dividers, mark off equal spaces along it like that. Then you can get something like a, like a, a, a round uh, a round needle file and just simply come along and in those areas file or even, or even semicirculars like that there so then when you do that you have that sort of look yep there we go so you have little sort of gallery like this so you've got this sort of look then you can perhaps get then if that was like a round needle file then you can get a, a triangular needle file to perhaps come in here now to put a little bit of a triangular shape 
like this and just repeatedly go along to make little shapes. Um, needle files are absolutely brilliant and you can do that and you've got a nice little unusual shape gallery. But needle files filing the straight heads like that is gonna be brilliant. You can even get something like a burr, um, a cylinder burr, and you can use the cylinder burr to go down and cut into the strip. If you make the strip first, you know the length that you're gonna need for a particular size stone. Then you can work out the divisions that you're gonna need. Then you can come along and cut them like this. Uh, you can even sort of, uh, you can even, uh, I don't know, come, come down um, and just cut a line at the end of each one like that. So you get a bit more of a decoration, perhaps cut all the way through or cut them at, instead of cutting down the strip, turn the strip horizontal and cut down halfway through the piece as well. So you get a bit more of a decorative line. But something like that, experiment with your files, with your burrs along a strip edge like that. As I said, you can just grab a, grab a strip uh, with, it, with a V and you can cut Vs along it. And that's going to give you a nice serrated type of uh, bezel. Uh, as I said, then you can come along with a, with a shorter V if you wanted in between like that. So get like, or like an M, M, M. There's lots of variations of things you can do. Anything like that would be absolutely brilliant. Nice and nice and easy. Uh, if you want these fancy, if you want cutouts, get a drill uh, and just drill a hole. Or even, you know, drill a hole here, drill a hole, drill a hole, drill a hole throughout it as well. And that looks like a quite nice, nice crown then, isn't it? Like that. But that would be the best way to get a nice serrated, nice patterned, uh, type of, of gallery or bezel or look through your uh, bullion dealer catalogues and you can get some nice gallery wire as well but have a play around like that and that really is nice okay louise um anything that we need to go through anything we need to say before we round it up i don't think so no apart from the change of time next we're changing day next week actually yes but we've got to go and capture a cat we gotta go and get our cat and put it in this box take it to the vet so don't forget it's next week it's going to be tuesday at 4 p.m hopefully um who's going to be back Ho hopefully sharon will be back next week and we'll be upstairs in our usual studio if not we're going to be back down here again oh bless you <laughs> excuse me <laughs> you're right there yeah just bless sneezing. you bless you uh so no don't forget so it's next week Tuesday, 4 p.m. Sorry we have to rush off this evening. Do apologise, but we've got to catch, we've got to sort and catch and take to the vet. But thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. We haven't announced our 10 uh, focus group members just yet. That will have to be next week. Been a bit short-staffed, a bit rushed off our feet. Haven't had much time to do that, so we'll make sure we get it sorted out. We had over 200 people apply for our focus group, so I really do thank you very much for that. We're going through it bit by bit hoping next week we'll be able to give you the results of that um and that was it was it louise nothing else I don't think so. any questions that came through that were really quick that we need to answer no mm. nothing at all plenty of questions do appreciate all the questions every single week we try and get through as many as we possibly can can't get through every single one if you haven't answered your question today get in next week on tuesday perhaps quarter to four, something like that. Get your question in nice and you'll even guaranteed then that we're gonna be able to answer it. So Louise, would like to say good night to the lovely people? Good night, lovely people. <laughs> <laughs> so no wine this evening, is there? No. No, no wine, dry no. night. Dry night, off to catch a cat. Just gonna go get clawed. Just gonna go. <laughs> I'm trying. Might be in shreds next time we see us. <laughs> so thank you so very much indeed. Appreciate you coming on today. Sorry we got to disappear. Um, Join us next Tuesday at 4 p.m. for another question and answer. Don't forget, part one of the Druzy is live on at the bench at the bench.com. It's down by here, our online jury training website, not on YouTube, but on at the bench.com. Part one of the Druzy. Take care. We will see you all next week. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.